Hi, and welcome back to Intellectual Property. Uh, so in our last class, we discussed the subject matter of design patents. And in today's class, we're gonna talk about design patent infringement, specifically how design patent infringement is proven and kind of reflecting on how proving design patent infringement is different from proving utility patent infringement. So as you'll recall, uh, in our last class, we uh, discussed how design patents actually work and what they cover and how they differ from utility patents, both in terms of how they're, uh, how they're actually put together and others, what kind of information is in the patent document and what design patents do. Specifically, design patents protect the ornamental, non-functional elements of a product rather than a rather article of manufacture rather than the functional components of an article uh, or of a of a product and they do that in a really different way so unlike utility patents design patents claim in the form of a picture and here you can see an example uh, of a design patent showing how that claiming in the form of a picture actually takes place. So in other words, this design patent is claiming the design pictured in the design patent document specifically, well, in this case, it's described as a barbecue grill with a pig motif. In other words, a barbecue in the shape of a pig. And specifically, the elements of the design that are claimed in the design patent are the elements of the drawing that are in solid lines, right? So only the solid line elements of the, the, of the picture design are the subject matter of the patent. And the parts of the drawing that are in broken lines are there to provide context, but aren't part of the claimed design itself. Okay, now, as I mentioned in the last class, there's some dispute about how to construe the scope of a design patent, right? So some people say it's just the drawing and that's it. And the only thing you should look to when determining the scope of design patent protection is the drawing that does the actual claiming. Others argue that the title and the uh, claim, the kind of claim in words in the design patent document should also inflect the scope of design patent protection specifically by narrowing it. Right. In other words, in the case of something like a uh, barbecue grill with pig motif design patent, the argument from one camp would be that anything in the shape of the, of the design pictured is uh, is going to be a potentially infringing product. Right. So any pig shaped product that takes advantage of that particular design that's pictured in the design patent would be infringing no matter what context in which it were produced. Whereas the alternative position would be that while the design patent goes to a product that looks like the picture design, it does so only in the limited context described in the design patent uh, document itself. In other words, uh, a barbecue grill in the shape of a pig that looked like the picture design might would be infringing, but a, uh, a product that looked like the design uh, in, pictured in the design patent in a totally different context might not be. In other words, if this were a piggy bank instead of a barbecue grill, the argument would be that maybe that shouldn't be infringing. Maybe the design patent should be limited to the context in which the design patent expresses uh, design patent protection. Okay, so what's the actual scope of design patent protection? In other words, what can become a design patent? Well, a design patent can't protect anything functional and it can only protect something that's ornamental. But those terms have a really specific meaning to the design patent context. In other words, when it comes to design patents, functional doesn't just mean an element of a product that accomplishes something. Functional means that it's the only way to accomplish a particular goal or at least the only way to accomplish a particular, particular goal effectively. So as you recall in our last class, we discussed uh, a, a case concerning design patent protection over, uh, over a oval shaped convex mirror for a bus. 
And the court said, that's not a functional design, at least for the purpose of design patent protection, because there's more than one way of accomplishing the same goal. In other words, more than one design would provide the same or similar field of view. Therefore, the design is protectable as a uh, design patent, uh, even though it does seem to contribute to the functionality of the product itself, simply because multiple ways of achieving the same function are are possible, right? So an element of design patent is ornamental and protectable so long as it's not dictated by the function. And in addition, not hidden during the entire lifetime of the product in question. So as you recall, that last element used to be a little bit broader in terms of what was treated as not being ornamental. In other words, at one point, courts said that, for example, the circular brush in a vacuum cleaner was not ornamental because you wouldn't see it while you're using the product. But the Federal Circuit has really limited the scope of that exception, saying that even something like the design of a hip prosthesis can be ornamental because Somebody might see it at some point, even though it very clearly is not something you're going to see while the product is actually being used by the person <laughs> in whom it's implanted, at least hopefully not. And in fact, in, in the case in question, the Federal Circuit went so far as to say that courts shouldn't opine on the appropriateness of somebody caring about the design of a product. It's none of their business, right? And if it's possible that the design of the product might uh, affect someone's uh, assessment of its desirability at any point during the lifespan of the product in question, then it should be treated as ornamental and therefore at least potentially the subject matter of design patent protection. So apparently the fact that doctors might have an aesthetic preference for one hip replacement design over another is sufficient to make a hip replacement product a uh, the subject matter of a design patent, even if as a policy matter, we might be concerned about doctors making uh, decisions about <laughs> which which hip replacement product to recommend on the basis of their aesthetic appeal. Okay, so then how do we determine whether an accused product actually infringes a design patent? Well, what the courts have done is adopt what's known as an ordinary observer test, right? They say it can't have, the requirement can't be for the accused product to be exactly the same as the uh, design patent drawing, uh, because that would, in a, sense, in a sense, vitiate the meaningful uh, scope of protection of a design patent in the first place. So what we do is we look to whether an ordinary observer, right? So this remember, not a fazita, not a person skilled in the art, but an ordinary observer, presumably an ordinary consumer, presumably whoever is doing <laughs> the uh, evaluation, uh, would look at the uh, accused product and the design patent drawing and think that they are essentially the same, right? Substantially the same, or rather the accused product is substantially the same as the picture design. Now, in addition, recall that when we're evaluating design patent infringement, we look at the design patent drawing, not at the product produced by the owner of the design patent, right? So the comparison is between the design patent drawing and the accused product, right? The design patent defines the scope of design patent protection, not the product that's realized by the owner of the design patent or the licensee of the design patent. So you have to compare the accused product to the patented design and see if the patented design reads onto the accused product pursuant to the ordinary observer test. Now compare that to the, what we do in the context of a utility patent, right? Where normally we expect every limitation of the utility patent claim to read onto the accused product. And if they don't, then the utility patent owner is going to have to go to the doctrine of equivalence and argue that it's non-literal infringement. It kind of looks like design patent infringement is to some degree always non-literal infringement, or at least non-literal infringement is always part of the uh, scope of design patent protection insofar as substantially the same is 
not identical to the same. Substantially the same means close enough, right? Rather than actually reading on to the, the picture design directly. In other words, it's kind of like we're doing the doctrine of equivalence all the time, right? If it's substantially similar, that's close enough rather than saying all the limitations have to be met or else the burden goes to the patent donor to prove that it's not sufficiently different to qualify uh, for, for, uh, for non-infringement. Okay, however, there is a limitation nonetheless on design patent protection, specifically on the scope of design patents in relation to the concept of novelty, right? So prior art does play a role in design patent protection, specifically in thinking about the the scope of design patent protection, you have to look to prior art in order to determine what the design patent actually brought to the table, right? So what does prior art do in this context? It narrows the scope of a design patent, right? In other words, you look at the patented design and ask whether the accused product is substantially similar to the patented design, but you can use prior art to determine which elements of the patented design were already anticipated. And if it's similar because of those elements, then the accused product is not going to be infringing, right? So this is a really important thing to keep in mind. Prior art can only narrow the scope of a design patent, right? Showing prior art that does something totally different, just irrelevant, right? What does prior art do in the design patent context, right? It, illuminates or indicates design features that can't be included within the scope of protection of a particular design patent, right? By virtue of them already being anticipated by a previously existing patent and therefore not being protectable. And this came up in the context of the uh, Egyptian, or rather was uh, uh, kind of established in the context of the Egyptian goddess v. Suisa case in which the claim was over a nail buffer with uh, three different surfaces and the accused product was a nail buffer with four sur surfaces and prior art was available to be used to determine what was actually new, what was actually protectable in the patented design. And uh, in the case book, he read the Wallace v. Idea Village Products Corporation case in which a, uh, a uh, shower wand uh, was the accused product with a uh, allegedly infringing the 990 patent, right? Well, if you just compare the shower wand to the patent, they do and look indeed look substantially similar, right? I mean, they're pretty close in terms of the appearance of the product and those obviously cosmetic differences between the two, right? But the accused product does seem to realize the features of the design patent. It would have been nice if they had uh, chosen a cleaner <laughs> version of the accused product, maybe buying a new one would have been a nice idea. Um, in any case, uh, the, uh, the court nevertheless did not find infringement under the circumstances because it said the prior art on point narrowed the scope of design patent infringement, right, or the, or the scope of the design patent in question. In other words, there were previous design patents, or rather previous patents, that went to shower wands, right? And therefore, you had to look to those prior patents in order to determine what the uh, design patent in, in question actually covered, right? And those prior art patents so narrowed the scope of design patent protection that Idea Village's accused product fell outside the scope of the patent in question. In other words, even though it was substantially similar, just comparing the drawing to the product, right? The previously existing, the prior art patents so narrowed the scope of protection of the design patent that the differences between the patent drawing and the product were sufficient to make the product non, non infringing. And I thought I'd share a little something special with you. This is actually a design patent model, right? This is from the uh, 1950s or 60s, if I remember correctly. Anyway, it was a model made uh, to picture a design patent for a perfume 
atomizer. Now this was not required. Uh, patent models were uh, discontinued as a patent uh, requirement in the late 19th century. Nevertheless, it was not uncommon uh, for people to continue making them at a much later date in order to picture the product in question. So here you can see an example of what was submitted uh, in support of a design patent application. Um, anyway, uh, in addition, you read the Oral Labs case uh, involving another design patent and whether it was infringed by uh, the uh, Oral Labs, uh, rather whether, whether it was infringed by the Kind Group product. So here you can see the uh, a, a, a version of the Kind Group EOS uh, Smooth Sphere lip balm as pictured in uh, the as pictured in the case as well. And the question is whether this product infringed on the design patent drawing you see you see here, and I can open it up and show you what the product look like, looks like and everything, right? Um, so uh, the defense from the kind group was that, look, this is anticipated by a previous design patent, which you can see pictured uh, here as well. And uh, the court compared the two and said, no, the prior art is sufficiently different from the design patent in question. And the allegedly infringing product is too close. And therefore, it remains infringing under the circumstances. Right? The prior art doesn't sufficiently narrow the scope of the design patent to make the two uh, not substantially similar under the circumstances. Okay, uh, however, right, uh, there is still an obviousness requirement when it comes to design patent infringement. So here in the MRC Innovations v. Hunter manufacturing case, we actually have a dispute between a design patent owner and his prior business partner or manufacturer of his dog jerseys. Uh, so here there were two design patents over football jerseys and baseball jerseys for dogs. Uh, the allegation was that the products being produced by Hunter were infringing and their response was that the design patents in question were, were invalid. Okay, so how did the court go about analyzing the question? Well, it looked again to prior art and it said, look, there's a primary reference of previously existing dog jerseys, right, which narrow the scope of the design patent considerably. And then it looked to other design patents in the same area and said essentially that all the features that show up and the 488, 487 and 488 patents uh, in question are in effect anticipated or obvious based on the prior art, both the primary reference and the secondary references, right? So maybe think about this in relation to the way we think about obviousness in the context of utility patents, right? Once again, as in the context of utility patents, right? The relevant universe of prior art is prior art in the area that's being practiced. In other words, you have to look to dog jerseys, not just to anything to ask about obviousness and whether or not the patent in question is invalid for uh, obviousness on obviousness grounds. Now, query how we should think about this in relation to the debate over the uh, the potential narrowing of the scope of design patent protection in light of the title and uh, claim as described in words in the design patent document, right? In other words, if we're going to ignore the title and claim in relation to thinking about the scope of the design patent on the front end, should we also ignore it when thinking about obviousness or should we import this idea about uh, related uh, related art in thinking about whether it would be obvious to incorporate a particular design element into a product. Interesting question. We'll talk about it in class.